All right. I think it's about time to get started. Um, before I was supposed to do this talk, I, um, I asked around and I was like asking people, are you uh, here as crazy about biking as your neighbors, your Dutch neighbors? And I got like very different answers. Mostly it was like, no, definitely not. So what a little bit of spoiler alert, I'll be talking a little bit about not just pipelines, but there will be some bikes involved. So bear with me. Um, my name is Rustam, and I, I'll introduce myself in a second, but I want to start with just showing you the bright future kind of thing. So um, you've seen those things before, right? So we can try to ask this thing uh, about bikes. So, um, hey, Google, what do you think the availability of bikes will be nearby, near my house? There are five bikes available at the moment. Based on historical data, the availability for this station will be decreasing for the next hour. I would suggest getting your bike within next 10 minutes. All right. Well, nice, right? That would be really nice. And the thing I'm going to be talking about are those kind of bikes that you rent. And uh, But first, let's rewind a little bit back in time and just like, to explain how did we get there or how can we get there. Um, so... The thing I'm talking about, the things I'm, uh, like I'm mentioning are those bicycles like this. This is a picture I took quite close to my hotel. And I'm not talking about the bikes there in the back. Uh, I don't think you can rent those. But the things in the front here, you can rent them by hour. And then <clears throat> you just use them. And then after a little bit of time, for some kind of period, you put them back. Um, the, I live in Oslo, in Norway, and th this is the bikes that we have. They're pretty much the same thing. I mean, you have them in San Francisco, you have them everywhere. The thing is that those in Oslo, I'm not sure how it is here, uh, but those in Oslo have a uh, public API. So you can actually um, query that thing and say, well, how many bikes are available at that stop for um, at this right moment? And... Um, the API is very basic. It will just return you just right now picture. So you don't really have any kind of prediction, any history, anything. And it is a very nice thing. And it's also, this is kind of pictures that they market. I asked the, 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 the guys and, and, well, people working for Oslo City Bike. And I was like, can I, can I use some of your promotional pictures and everything? And they were like, yeah, sure. Here you go. So this is the picture, one of the promotional pictures. And it's really, really nice. You have lakes and green grass and bicycles and sun. And this is how it looks also, well, another promotional picture that they got, I got for them. The thing that they don't show you is that this is kind of half of the year. The other half of the year might be looking like this. So you have a little bit less time enjoying those bicycles. That's the point, right? But this is, this is back to kind of marketing thing. So basically, the sign says, spring, tralala, -la, spring. And, well, you know, spring, now the ice is gone and everything, so you can actually enjoy those things. Well, most of the time. And this is kind of not always how those uh, bike locks or th whatever you call those things, they look. Uh, most of the time, they will be either totally full or totally empty. And, well, when you actually have to bike and you go there and there is no bikes available or you come to your destination wherever you were supposed to bike and you put your want to lock that bike so you don't get fines and everything, because if you don't return it within some time, they will give you fines and stuff. So when you, when you come there and you try to put it back and everything is full, then you have to bike around and look for another stop and everything. And it kind of a little bit sucks. And at some point, you get a little bit sad. Um, and then, well, you're just like, ah, oh, come on. This is, this is just wrong. I mean, it's like it's no, no bikes, all full. Nothing in between. How, how does this work? This, this must be something wrong there. So then you just realize that, well, you know what? I know IT, I know computer science, and, well, you know, I work, I kind of get paid for doing that. So um, I can solve that. And then um, you kind of start developing a like master plan of the whole thing, how you're going to go ahead with this. And this is kind of the chain of thoughts that appeared. It was like, first, you were like, OK, well, do we have bikes? No, we don't have. Well, that sucks. Um, where can we find those? Well, I don't really know because I have an app 
and that app will tell me where the bikes are available right now. And when they are, it's right now picture. So if there is like one bike, you know that by the time you'll get from home out and to that stop, the bikes will be gone. Or, uh, well, that bike might be broken or something like that, right? So, <sighs> sucks. Okay, um, next step. Can I use the app? Well, we talked about that. No, you can't. Um, can you use a public API? Do we have an API? And then you realize that they actually do have public API, which is very nice. And then you're like, okay, cool, maybe, maybe we can do that. But the thing is that you don't get any historical data. Uh, so you kind of have to collect it yourself. So then you're like, okay, fine, I can do that. I mean, I can collect the data. Um, and then you have another problem. You just have a bunch of files or a bunch of entries for a specific period of time, and then you have to put it somewhere so you can actually do some analysis, right? And then you realize that you might need some kind of data warehouse or something like that to store that, or at least a database, at least like Excel sheet or something. Okay, where do you, how do you do that? Well, you know, I'm working with um, enterprise things, and I kind of do all this kind of stuff. So I might just have a look at some kind of data warehouse. So we'll go full enterprise because, well, you know, we like to over-engineer things. Um, but then, how do you parse those output of that, whatever REST service? Typically, it would be a JSON um, REST service, some kind of thing over HTTP. How do you do that? Do I have to write my own script and parse the whole thing and just, like, try to maintain all that. That sounds like a lot of pain, a lot of headache, and lots of kind of man data, data wrangling. So, no, that doesn't work. Okay, um, so we need something flexible, portable, something really nice that would work, right? Well, that would be nice. And then, and then you kind of start looking for that thing. Is there a framework that would, that, that would help you with this? And at some point, you're just like, okay, fine, you know, this is how I'm going to solve it. And this is kind of uh, what I'm, I'm going to be uh, showing you as an example of this data processing kind of thing. Um, and this, is, this has been my pet project for a uh, while well, with like on and offs for two years-ish. I was kind of collecting data for two years now, and just, just because, uh, and trying to do some fun things with it. So this was my kind of playground, learning Apache Beam. That's the thing I'm, I'm going to be talking about. Um, so my name is Rustam. I, uh, as I said, I work and live in Oslo, in Norway. I work for a cons consultancy company called Computos. I am a um, Google developer expert for cloud, uh, I, and also I'm a Java champion. Um, I do a lot of things for community. I've been running uh, for the last three years. I've been leading a conference called Java Zone, which is, well, uh, almost the same size, same size as this one uh, in Oslo. Um, before that, I was also doing a lot of stuff. I still do a lot of things. So um, this is me, not without any further ado. Let's go to the architecture because, well, you know, we developers will love our architecture. Uh, we, we architect things. We put them in a nice little boxes. And this is kind of the first draft of the whole monster system would kind of look like, right? So you have a some kind of a, a time-based job that will be pinging a, a API that will dump the historical data. Um, then you'll have, uh, you'll store them typically in the files, at least in my case it was, because, well, it would just return you a huge, huge, huge JSON for all stops in, in the whole city, uh, which is kind of a weird thing to do, but that's how API was. This is what you had to live with, so life is hard. Um, then you would put it in something that will be able to process it, so for example, like Apache Spark, and then you will put it in some kind of database, and then you can run some kind of analysis, right? So queries, um, you can build a notebook on top of that, something simple. Um, if you have a stream, which, well, in my case, there was no stream, but I'll still show you some examples of how streams and things, like how we can ha handle those as well. Uh, but then you will end up with some kind of Apache Storm thing and then put it on, on some kind of da dashboard with analytics and stuff, right? 
So this is kind of the basic thing, and we all obviously go for serverless or kind of lambda architecture with all those small micro functions doing separate things and just like you know. But the problem is that you have to run all that on um, on your own uh, machine or something like that. So for quite some time, I had a um, a tiny Raspberry Pi running on on my. Um, uh, TV desk table thing, uh, where when it was just running and just pinging that endpoint, collecting data, putting it somewhere, and it, at some point it gets really annoying because your kind of room starts to look more and more about like uh, like like a server room, and the Raspberry Pi is not really obviously not powerful enough to know, run all of that, so it will just you know. Then you have another one, then you have another one, then another one, and then you get a little bit sad, and everybody at home gets a little bit sad because, well, you know, all that junk. Um, and then you realize there's this thing that I kind of uh, mentioned already, but um, I can mention again. Uh, it's an open source library called Apache Beam that um, can do kind of things like that for you, and mostly out of the box. Uh, so you will have a uh, possibility for batch processing, so files, uh, and also a streaming, so it will also be able to take streams. It can understand, or you can program that thing in, in, in uh, Java or Python, and it can also connect to lots of different things. So you can run that thing locally on your machine, you can run that in the cloud, you can do, like, you can connect to various storage systems and, and like uh, you can actually connect that thing to Apache Spark and, and Flink and well, you know, all the other things. So then you um, try to do something about this architecture, right? So we have here two different streams. We have a batch one and we have a streaming one, but uh, with Replacing that thing with Apache Beam, you don't, you kind of simplify the whole thing. So now we've got rid of Pipeline. So we just put both of them in there, put it in the data warehouse, and you're done. Um, but we're still running on the local machine. You can do that, but I also kind of had to look at like how how does it how it's going to be on on the cloud. And well, I chose Google Cloud because that's the thing I work mostly with. So it was uh, that choice was kind of easy for me. Uh, so now I kind of translated all the generic terms of a cron jobs and um, a data processing and so on, a warehouse and things like that, into um, the cloud version of those, managed versions of that. So then you still have a cloud functions with some kind of cron uh, time thing. Uh, you put it on a bucket uh, on, the, on, on the cloud storage, uh, and then you pick those uh, files from uh, cloud storage, or if you use streaming, you will pick it from there, and then you will process it with the same kind of code, with the same uh, thing, no matter what, which is nice. You put it into a, I decided to put it into data warehouse, like BigQuery, not a database, because I wanted to play around with some statistics and everything, but you don't really have to. You can do whatever you want. Um, and then you do some kind of analysis on top of that. Um, to explain that, I want to talk a little bit about pipelines and what is actually a pipeline. Well, a pipeline is, uh, that's the definition of the thing, right? It's a, um, it's, it's a, it's an acyclical graph. So basically it is something what, um, a conveyor belt or, or whatever, kind of a fancy conveyor belt, when you put something on one end, and then it goes into the box and magic happens and something else goes out on the other end. And there are no circles, so you cannot just send data back and do some more stuff and do this. So acyclical, right? Um, and you can do things. You can convert data, you can uh, add data, you can subtract, well, you know, you can do all kind of uh, things. So. How do we do a simple, very simple pipeline? This was kind of my start on, of the whole thing. But to do that first, we'll have to look at the data, the data that I had to work with. And um, this is how it looks. So there are two endpoints. Uh, there is one endpoint that will provide you information with metadata about each station. So you will have a, uh, that's the one you see on the right there. You will have an ID, you will have a name and a title and a subtitle and how many locks do you have and things like that. So it will just give you all kind of information about the station. Um, 
the other one that you will have on your left uh, is is an uh, is a now picture of how that station availability on that station looks like, right? So. Um, yeah, it will give you a number of bikes available, number of locks available, and what else? Yeah, and just an ID and overflow capacity and everything. Uh, so, very simple thing. The problem is, as I told you already, it's uh, that um, it will give you information for all stations at the time. You cannot just ask one particular stop. Well, I guess that's what we have to work with. Uh, what you want to do with all that, you want to put it into something like this. This was the first version. This was like a first screenshot of uh, the data that I was able to process and put into a, a tabular form uh, where you would have a, well, IDs, number of available bikes, uh, available locks, uh, if they have overflow capacity. Overflow capacity is basically they don't let you... Uh, they don't fill up the station uh, till 100%. So they will leave a few uh, locks available So you, in case you're coming and they just refilled it. So there will be some locks, then you can put some stuff. Um, I'm not sure what they're doing with that because they actually at some point removed that. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But, well, you have some kind of parameters and you have a date. Okay. So how do we do this? We do, the way we do that, we do... Um, we, we want to do it in parallel because we have a lot of uh, files. So this is the solution I went for is to dump data four times an hour. So every 15 minutes, it would ask, it would get those two, um, those two files, very long files, big files with um, not printed printed like that, but just like very compact and very ugly. And then it will just store it. So. Uh, to do that, and then you will have to process it, and often I would kind of wait with running it and uh, without processing it for some time, just accumulate them and then just process it in, in one big bang. Uh, because, well, I was playing around and I was doing manual. I, I wanted it to be manual. Um, the way you do that, you separate it in, um, you put code that can be paralyzed, para, paralyzed, oh, that's a funny word, um, in Pardus. Um, and that's kind of code that can be run separately from each other without uh, interfering with each other, right? So typically, reading files and parsing the JSON and converting it to something and putting in, putting into the one big data structure that would be a typical thing that you would do um, with a, with a, some uh, Pardue like this. And the code would be look very simplified. Code would be looking like this. I can show you. Um, I can show you the the, the, the real code uh, in a second. Yeah, that's the thing. So I put everything because well, that project was a bit of a pet project, and it was a, a project where I wanted actually to learn and to see how things work. So for for those purposes, I just did not separate anything into different files or anything. So you have one big long file, but it's kind of easier to get a, a idea what's happening, and those pardus would in normal life would look like this. I will zoom in a little bit. Well, if we remove this for now. Yeah, well, so this is, this is kind of what you do. You do like, you convert, you read stuff and you put it in hash maps and stuff like that. Not very advanced, not very um, super fancy, but well, it, it does what it does. Um, yeah, this is, this is, this, we'll look at that later. So, for now, we'll go back to the presentation that is supposed to be here. Yes, there it is. Um, so, the pardus, things you can separate, right? You write those. And then you run that thing, and it will come with the, the project and everything will come with the Maven file, so you can, you don't really have to do much. Um, you will you will have to provide a um, main class, and you'll have to provide what files it's supposed to be reading and where it should output. This is a local runner. So if you look at the first par parameter there, say saying p direct runner, that means I want to run this thing on my machine. Um, if, if you want to do the same thing on a cloud, only thing you will really have to do 
I'm going to switch slides now, but just follow, see if you can see the changes. Because there will be a few more lines, but I want you to notice the first line, the direct runner changes to date flow runner. And then you have a few extra lines in the bottom there that will uh, point at the right buckets and point to like temp directory. So it's not really very, very fancy extra stuff. So it's actually more or less the same thing. The code is the same, just the command line things that are different. And that is really, really nice uh, because uh, because, well, because you don't have to change anything. Um, my pointer is where it is. There it is. Okay. So, going back, this is a local version. This is a cloud version. The first pipeline I created looked like this. It was very, very simple. So, you read files. You... Um, process data because I want to rearrange everything inside. I want to remove the duplicating fields. I want to um, do some, because for, for instance, I would like to add also a, a date and a timestamp when the data was updated and things like that. And then I add map elements, write it to a database, warehouse, BigQuery, anything. And then, well, you just drop things. Um, the first time I was running it, it was a year ago, uh, well, give or take. Uh, so then I had around four or five months of data, I guess. Um, that thing ran for 18 minutes, and it spin up around, what is that, 17, 18 machines, I guess. So you can see at the graph at the end there, in the cloud. So it would kind of look at the inputs and look at the number of files and the size of those, and it would be like, oh, okay, I can do that with... Uh, two machines, three machines, six machines, and so on, so on, so on. At some point, it was just, no, I think I really need 18. And then it processed with 18 machines, and then every, when everything was done, it just dropped it. So that was the first version. Very simple pipeline, no fancy things there any, uh, anywhere. Uh, I ended up with just 35 megs of data in, in, in the database, uh, but it was kind of, it wasn't big data, but it was kind of, getting in that direction. 1.1 million rows, eh, it's okay. Um, so that was in September a year ago. Then I did a new version of that because I wanted to have add more data and I wanted to learn a bit more about how uh, data flow works. So then I ended up with this. And here you actually do two things. Now you're reading both uh, files, so both um, uh, availability file and um, uh, station metadata file, uh, then you parse them and you re rearrange data the way you want. Uh, at some point, you will do the CO group by key thing. That means that what you basically do, you merge those two tables. Think of it as a table. So you merge those two by, an, by a key. And in my case, it would be an ID for a station. So just merge all that. So I'll add all metadata about the station for each entry because I kind of wanted to know where it's from and make it a bit more readable. And well, I wanted, to be honest, I wanted really to play with this merge group by thing as well. So. That was the thing. Uh, this is what I did, a, um, I think it was two days ago, three days ago, well, last Saturday. Um, it took me 14 minutes, so the previous was 18, this one was 14. Uh, here I processed all data for 2019 from 1st of January until um, September. And we did spin up quite a few machines. We are at, what, 160, 150-something machines. Um, but still, process that, right? And, well, it was quite a lot of data. It was five gigs of data that, uh, of pure text files that I had to process, which was, well, I mean, five gigs is quite, quite a lot of data in pure text. Again, 14 minutes. And then you end up with something like this. My database exploded to be one terabyte, uh, no, sorry, gigabyte, not terabyte. Not, not, no, 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 we're not going there. Uh, not yet. Uh, in a few years, maybe. Uh, so one gigabyte. Um, number of rows from 1.1 million, we are uh, up uh, to 13 million. And yeah, well, that's pretty much it. So that was last modified in November 3rd, and today is 7th. So yeah, four days ago. Um, 
Okay. But then I was processing actually five gigs of files. And then I was a little bit scared because I did not, I couldn't see the bill. I could guess because you can actually, when you look at this thing and you look at the resource metrics at the bottom there, uh, some of those numbers can give you like a rough estimate. Uh, especially if you've been running it before, you'll know kind of what to expect. But I kind of didn't really think about that. And I was like, wow, this is, this is probably going to cost me. Um, but then I saw this. Uh, when I checked that today, it was in like 7,000% or something. I don't know why. Just like it went up. The, 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 the number went slightly down, but the, the percentage went like skyrocketing. Can you guess how much that was? 12 euros. Anyone else? 12 euros goes once. 12 euros goes twice. 13. 13 goes once. 13 is Sold to the gentleman over there for 13 euros. Um, almost. <laughs> it was actually the price of a reasonably good espresso. And um, <laughs> the billing, actually, the, 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 the thing where I clipped that thing out uh, from looked like this. No costs at all, or I think it was like costs of like a few cents for storage. And then I did the, uh, the processing with, with Dataflow, which is like managed version of Apache Beam, which is exactly the same thing, exactly the same code and everything. And, <laughs> and then, then it kind of spiked horribly to three euros. And then it went back to pretty much nothing. So storage, it kind of stays at around, stays at around 0 0.3, 0 0.7, something like that. And then the, the, the processing and everything goes up and down. So then you get a little bit surprised by that. Um, I want to do one thing while I'm talking. OK, I'll do that in a second. Um, the cool thing is that, the cool thing with Apache Beam, and I, the thing I really liked with it is, um, and well, I have to say, I mean, I don't really, the Apache, I don't, I'm not really connected to with the Apache Beam or anything like that. I mean, the, it was just the purpose of this thing was to learn and to play around and see how it works. So for me, it was just like a learning experience and I wanted to see how far I can push that thing. So I extended that thing. I showed my data and my data, uh, database and everything to a colleague of mine. And he's a very big fan of another open source project that is called ArangoDB. It's a kind of slightly fancy database that does like lots of things. Uh, and then he was like, give me the data. Can, can, you, can you pipe the data over to me? And I was like, yeah, sure, I can do that. That's easy. Um, so I piped this thing uh, with, with Apache Beam to like over to his endpoint thing. He dumped that into a Arango database, and then he just made out of the box so kind of a map solution. It's very fancy. It's like super fancy UX. I mean, as you can see, we spent a lot of time designing the, uh, the, the user experience of that page. Uh, but basically, the idea is that you, um, you can either get a random station or you can put, put in an, an ID of a station that will show you like average availability and stuff like that for that. And then you get a, it's kind of surprised again because, well, it was too easy. It was a little bit too... My first experience when I kind of run the whole thing, I was like, what did I do wrong? Because it just works. It took some time to get it working, but it just works. So now we're kind of here, right? So we're at, at, at the file system, you do Apache Beam, and you do all the other things. In the meantime, I want to do one little thing. So while I'm talking, I want to, um, I'm going to process locally. I'm going to set up a local run for, uh, oh, can, you, can I do, I'll do this. So, um, I am in, uh, I'm just going to process three days of data for August 2018, totally random um, date uh, or time or whatever, uh, just because I had the data locally. So 576 files looking like this, pretty much almost the same um, size of those because just the numbers change, so not, not much is, is changing. So. We're going to do this. This is uh, just an ugly version of the same kind of thing I showed you on, a, uh, on the, um, uh, on the um, slides. 
uh, direct runner. So I'll let that thing run for a second. It will take some time and probably will, will at least I will hear the fan going on uh, here. And if everything goes well, then we should be able to, um, we should be able to, yes, we can zoom, of course. Um, we should be able to see some files appearing here. But it will take some time, so we're going to go back to presentation. I'll tell you when, I, when it's done. I can see it here, but you can't. Um, so this is how far we got, right? We created the, uh, the pipeline for files and everything. Now the fan is going on. Can you? I'm not sure if you can hear that, but well, um, <clears throat> let's talk about, in the meantime, while the, the, it's a bit cold in here, so the computer is working to warm it up uh, a little bit. Um, let's talk about uh, going from batch to stream. So say one day this fancy um, bike service, city bike thing, decides to go from, um, from files and JSON and everything to actually streams. Um, yeah, the streams. Um, <clears throat> how does this work? And the thing is, the, the problem with streams is that the data might come with unknown delays. It's not just like you get a file, everything is in there, and you're done. It's actually data might come in at 8 o'clock, data for 8 o'clock, but data for 8 o'clock might also arrive at 8.30, and it might also arrive at, well, 2.30 or something like that. And then you have a problem because you actually have to do some fancy things. And what you can do, you can uh, do quite a bit of things with Apache Beam where you can do, uh, you can do transformations, obviously. You can also do windowing. You can do trademarks and triggers. You can do accumulation and things like that. And this is the kind of thing that you would typically do. The fan is going faster. Um, I kind of feel that I have to share that joy of computer working. Ah, huh, okay. It's switched. Go back. We're still not done. Um, so you can do element-wise transformation. You just pick one thing, you convert it to something else, and you put it back. Um, not really back, but you put it into something somewhere else, right? You can do also aggregation. You can count things. You can also do a mix of all these things, right? Um, when you do grouping, you would typically put it in, like, slice it in windows, and then you will try to, for, uh, to, to group them in, into buckets. And this is what you would normally end up doing. And Apache Beam will help you doing that quite a bit. Because one thing is uh, doing by timestamp, uh, and that is a typical thing what you would do with all the things that has to do with time. But you might also want to do it based on sessions and some other things as well. So you're not, it's not always just a timestamp. You might want to group by other things. And the, it will let you do that as well, because as long as you design proper keys and do it right, uh, it will do that for you. It will help you with that as well. Uh, so for example, if you want to pick up a windowing and you want to pick a window for, um, let's see, um, I want a sliding window of uh, five minutes, and I want to check that window every one minute. This is pretty much the code that will have to do that. You don't have to write all the fancy logics and everything. You just say, well, uh, duration standard minutes five, uh, every duration standard minutes one. Then you get a bit surprised again. So this was kind of, this was kind of me. Uh, with with like every every time I would figure out new thing, I was like, whoo. So this was our database, right? Um, let's see if that is done. Hey, it's built. Success. Wow. I actually, I there is a tiny little secret. I managed to break the build ten minutes before coming in here because I managed to upgrade a few libraries. That's a very good idea. Upgrade your palm just before you do talk. It would just break, br broke horribly. And at last second, I realized that I did upgrade to Jackson libraries and I had to revert that and it built. So, you know, um, every build success now, I'm kind of happy to see. Um, what happened is that it did pick all those files for first three days in August that looked like this, horribly ugly. Um, 
well, some of them are just on one line and huge line, and sometimes just IntelliJ would just do the line shift for you because it's too long and it says they're up on top. But um, the point is, you have lots of files like this, and it has lots of repeating information that you don't really want, and then it got converted into something like this. Um, so, yeah, you have an ID, you have if it's in service or not, it has... Um, it has lots of empty fields. That's, that was uh, I, uh, probably that's for um, for the stations that are not in use. There are actually some of them as well. So actually, I had to handle that. But this is this is looks more like a right kind of data. So this is what I did locally, right? Um, there is another thing that I really want to set start going while I'm talking is to start a similar thing. Because the thing is, I did pr process data until September 2019. Um, I did not process the last month. Um, so, while I'm talking, this is like really, I, I'm kind of pushing my luck here with demo guns. So if anything breaks, that's not my fault. That's the internet connection, I guess. That's the good thing with cloud. You can always blame. Um, so I did not do anything. I just copied the text uh, that points to a uh, storage. Uh, and then I had like a, a, a regex like this. So I'm saying like everything 2019, 10, anything, you pick that and you process that. Um, so while that is thing working, uh, we'll go back to the presentation. So 13 million rows, soon it will be a few more. Um, what you can do with that? And this is what we were kind of, I, after collecting that data for almost a year, I, I, I asked that the same colleague of mine, he has, he's a very, very big fan of databases, as you probably figured, the guy with the Orango DB. Uh, so I asked him, I was like, Should, do you want to like, meet one evening and then we can look at SQL? Um, strangely enough, he said yes. Uh, so we did look at SQL, um, and it did got very long, that query. Um, but it actually got, it was actually quite some fun because you can, um, where is this thing? There, um, let's see, uh, saved queries, project queries, uh, average availability, open that. Yeah, so this is, this is how it looks. Quite big, fancy, tiny little thing. And then we run that on 13 million rows. And then you can actually pick some fun, interesting stories. You can actually see, like for example, uh, let's see, that's day of week, that's four, so Thursday, Thursday around six o'clock on the month 10. You see, we're actually get, starting to get 10 a month, uh, the, the new data is coming in. Um, there is pretty much no bikes available. It's one, 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 bikes. So that's probably like a half of a wheel or something uh, that is available. But <laughs> the number of locks available there is 27. This is, uh, this is right by the university campus in Oslo, the theological faculty, apparently. Um, <clears throat> But there is a lot of other places where you can actually see, and then you can actually see patterns. You can actually pick uh, all the places where they have too many broken bikes, too many uh, things that uh, too empty, too too full, all those kind of things. Um, I did save a few other queries that are a bit fun. I um, let's see, saved queries. No scheduled, not scheduled. Saved project. Uh, what the heck? Oh, there it is. Um, so yeah, this is this is take another stop right by the university campus because I picked university things because they are very easy to have a look at. So now we're actually looking at one specific stop, and it's also kind of very easy to predict that things will kind of be empty uh, around the any day of the week except for Saturday, for some odd reason. Uh, no, the normal availability is pretty much zero. So if you actually think you won't be able to buy, get a bike, it's, that's what it is. 
Um, so now, actually, if you look um, here, yeah. worker pool stopped, and it actually did finish running. So let's see what happened here. Um, it might have failed, or it might have processed everything nicely. We'll find it out in a second. It did fail. Fantastic. But that's a good thing, because then I can actually show you that things um, fail. And also, uh, it's, it's a fantastic time for a rant. Um, and it's very interesting that it's not showing you why it failed. Because normally, you would have logs there. It needed to refresh. So you can actually see why it fails, and then it will just return you very weird things. So apparently, what happened was that my mask was wrong. So I did not get any matches for that, which is kind of strange. But um, this is my bucket. Yeah, I do have files. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Um, things fail sometimes. So I was I said I, I was pushing my luck now. Um, mirror displays. Extend. Good. Can we go back to the presentation mode? Yes, please. Thank you. So um, the thing is that the, the data we were trying to do, which actually failed quite fast, but still, it was actually 600 megs of data. So it was quite a bit. And it still was kind of able to read and process that data quite fast. I mean, well, it didn't do much, but it still had to read all the files, all 6,000 of them. Uh, key takeaways are, I mean, you've seen the, the first one. You've seen. Uh, and the main one, because most of the time you will not spend processing data in the data pipeline. You, you will make it work, and it will work. But then all the odds will be against you, because um, first, uh, your providers are we're, we're going to change the, uh, the APIs. So your APIs will change. And then you have to adopt to that. So as I told you already, uh, they removed a few fields. So what happened when I was looking at the, uh, I was looking at the dashboard uh, throughout the year, I just realized that in um, April, things just kind of started giving me a red errors and like emails and saying like, hey, something is wrong here. And then I looked at the date and I realized that it was kind of first, in, like from 1st of April, it started giving me an errors, like HTTP errors for a few days, then it disappeared. Uh, then it was gone, the whole service, the whole backend of the, the REST API thing was gone for a month. And then on 1st of May, it successfully appeared back with small, slight, tiny little changes that broke everything else. Uh, but then one of the things that broke uh, actually was really, really surprising and a bit weird. Uh, they actually started pretty printing uh, JSON. So they went from... Yeah, well, I'm not going to show you. Uh, but, well, they just went from the ugly JSON to, like, pretty printed JSON. And you would think, like, what's wrong with that? That's fine. Well, the problem is that uh, Apache Beam does not like that. Uh, it's something with, uh, I tried to figure out why, and it seems like it's something with uh, the way it handles the, and parallelizes jobs and really wants to read li line by line. Otherwise, it gets confused, and it's not really able to parallelize things. Uh, but, well, in any case, it did break. And it took me some time to realize, because I was just getting like a uh, wrong JSON, wrong format, wrong thing, and I wouldn't know what it is. Um, and then you would look and look and look and look, and at, at the end you just figure out that you find, find that tiny little note on Stack Overflow where it says, well, we don't really support um, uh, multi-line JSON. Uh, another thing is that your um, the data will... Yeah, well, you will spend data wrangling with data most of the time. Your pipeline will work, but, well, yeah, you have to work with this. And then when you put that data into the database uh, and you have this kind of fantastic picture, all of it working, you will have to do some kind of thing on top of that. You'll have to do some kind of processing. You'll do some kind of analytics and everything. But this is a bit outside. I did show you a little bit of that on... Um, 
on BigQuery, but that's kind of outside. This is, this, this is something else. We're talking about pipelines now, right? Um, the cool thing also is that you can replace and sw swap all, all the components. You don't really have to be running only on Google or only on anything. The storage, for example, you can just plug in uh, Amazon uh, storage there, or you can use Hadoop for storing files. Like I was using just file system, and it's not really very handy and nice to handle five gigabytes of tiny little files of 100 kilobytes each. Uh, so you can do that. You can also connect to uh, Kafka and stuff like that that will give you the data, that will stream the data to you. And uh, well, the, the Apache Beam kind of ties it all together. So what I did is a, a kind of a pet project. It's a fun project. And uh, the idea was to learn and be able to teach the others uh, or show at least an example to others. Because when I started, wanted to learn uh, or to get into Apache Beam, all I could find was a few examples that they really make sense to me now after I learned how these things work. But in the beginning, it was really tough for me to, to realize how things are connected. And uh, then I needed my own kind of story. And that story of kind of trying to beat those bike people that put the bikes into the locks and so you can actually beat them and know what the availability is going to be in a few days. That was kind of a slightly a tiny little nerdy motivation, but it was also kind of a better story for me to, 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 to understand how things work and to put it all together. So the code, uh, mostly compiling code, ref the the previous comment that was that broke my build 10 minutes, like, well, one hour ago now. Um, I will fix, I will submit the, the latest changes as soon as I am done. But the code and working code with a little bit of explanation, everything is there. And you can also ping me on on Twitter, on email, on anything, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to help or try to help in any case. And um, well, we have we still have four minutes, so we can do uh, we can do some questions if you have any. Are there any questions? It's really hard to see. No, you're you're all, you're really quiet, audience. Okay, well. Uh, I'm going to be here, so come down and ask me some more questions. If you want to see the code, I'll show you the code as well. It's, well, it's kind of, there, there, there are a few fun things in here. Uh, like, for example, that you have to set up your own, um, I know I'm sc scrolling a lot, just give me a second. Like, for example, this, where you set up your um, database and things like that. So, um, and schema. Um, Thank you very much all for coming and well enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>